We have, you may have noticed in our society, a group of people who call themselves progressives. Mm -hmm. You know, they've hijacked the word progress. The hidden assumption is what they want actually is progress. A more powerful government would be progress. Uh, I, I figure if they can hijack the word progress, I can hijack the word freedom. Hi, I'm Zach Weissmuller for Reason TV. We're here in Utah in the Overstock.com headquarters with Overstock CEO Patrick Byrne. Patrick, thank you very much for talking to us. Zachary, it's an honor to be on Reason. Uh, you recently returned from a medical leave. You had a serious health scare. We didn't even know if you were going to come back, but now you're back at the helm of Overstock. You're launching some new things. Uh, do you feel well or are you excited about where things are going from here? I do. I feel great. I have been, uh, I'm actually healthier than I've been in about 30 years. And I've come back just as we've inflected and we're charging. We have some terrific new products we're introducing. What are some of the new products uh, that we're, we can look forward to? Well, some of them have to do with the, our Wall Street endeavors, which I'm sure we'll be talking about, mm -hmm. T-Zero. Yes. Uh, but also we're going international in our, in our retail business. We're going international. We're adding a cars, a beautiful cars tab, uh, where you can search 4 million cars. That goes live tonight. Uh, there's a number of internal things that that make just make the site smarter that are rolling out in the weeks ahead. So. Overstock.com is one of the top 25 online retailers, and that's why it was such a big deal when you became the first of those retailers to start accepting Bitcoin. Why did you decide to do that, and uh, what kind of results did you see? Well, I'm philosophically pro-freedom, and so and I'm a long relationship with with Nick Gillespie and Reason, to, and I, I've, I love this organization. So when Bitcoin came along, I, I'm just I'm supportive of the idea of a form of money that no government Mandarin can create with a stroke of a pen. Since we're probably not going to get the country to go to a gold standard or the world to go to a gold standard, and gold would be impractical in a and uh, you know because it's not digital Bitcoin seems like the next best thing maybe even better because it is because you can beam it across the galaxy as they call it in South Park they call it space cash this is space cash my understanding of how you deal with the space cash is you you pretty much immediately convert it to US dollars but you've given your employees the option to be paid partially or wholly in Bitcoin has anyone taken you up on that offer oh there are people we we convert when people spend Bitcoin here we convert 90% of it back into dollars and we have to pay our suppliers and then we just we're hoarding we're accumulating 10% uh, and we do allow employees to be paid, uh, I think, their bonuses in Bitcoin huh. as a way of just encouraging adoption. We want to get the, you know, the, uh, they say on Wall Street, liquidity begets liquidity. And what is it about Bitcoin and maybe the blockchain more generally that excites you the most? Well, the big picture is this. For 6,000 years, humans have had this issue when we engage in consensual exchange. Can I trust you or not if you're a stranger? If I'm giving you a camel, I'm trading you for one gold coin. Well, I don't know if you've debased the gold coin or not. So there's a business model. The business model is that whoever has monopoly on violence in this area says, okay, I'll issue coins with my stamp my face on it. Anyone debases this, I kill. That's just a business model. It's a way of monetizing one's monopoly on violence. We happen to put that business model, we call it government, but fundamentally it's a business model. And there's really a couple hundred business models that, uh, ha that have that same common denominator. Say land, if you want to buy land from me, I can give you a piece of paper that says I own this land and now you own it, but you don't know whether to trust that. So we create this central institution, a land office, a land registry, that we all, tr you don't have to trust me, we, I don't have to trust you, we, it's just trust it. And so there's all, these, there's all these functions that let our civilization run that really have that common denominator. There's some central institution that injects trust into a consensual exchange. So that means that for 5,000 years, civilization has accumulated these institutions like barnacles on our hull. And now the blockchain lets us scrape those barnacles off. And one industry that you were attempting to disrupt with that model is what we alluded to earlier with T0, which would involve disrupting the financial industry and trading. Can you explain what the concept behind that is? Sure. Well, on Wall Street, when you buy 100 shares of IBM, let's say, on your E-Trade account, and I'm over on my Ameritrade account, and you, you're buying the 100 shares, you're paying, let's say, $9.95, I'm paying $9.95 to buy them. 
those fees we pay actually go to feed a lot of mouths. The settlement system, the system that actually lets the stock and money change hands, is much the plumbing, in other words, the back office plumbing of Wall Street is much more complicated and, and expensive than people understand. So the functions that a big chunk of Wall Street provides at a very high cost to society can really now be done more or less for free through the blockchain. So we have built a blockchain version of Wall Street. And not only are the expenses much lower, but there's all kinds that you may have heard if you haven't been living under a rock in the last decade, there's all kinds of mischief that occurs on Wall Street. Various forms of that mischief actually become imp impossible in a blockchain-based Wall Street. Could you give an example of uh, one type of mischief that might be prevented by uh, this kind of technology? Sure, naked short selling. Mm -hmm. Naked short selling, which is a form of manipulating the market. Without getting too technical, mm -hmm. there's various loopholes in the rules that govern settlement. There's basically what's fault tolerance. And there's, I understand why it was built with fault tolerance, but the fault tolerance some bad guys figured out how can you can use that fault tolerance in the system to actually manipulate by selling stocks that you don't deliver and things like this. It gets too technical to explain, but it just becomes impossible to do in a blockchain-based capital market. When we look at Bitcoin, for instance, it hasn't always gotten the warmest reception from politicians and regulators. We have Chuck Schumer, for instance, uh, seems uh, highly disturbed by its existence. Well, he's protecting his clients, <laughs> his clients being the Wall Street firms. Do you think that uh, something like this that, uh, that applies blockchain technology to the financial sector uh, would be a major target for uh, the Chuck Schumers of the world? It would be, and it was, but it's out of their control now. This thing can all be recreated now in any graduate Department of Mathematics around the world. It's all based on white papers and stuff that's out there. And if they don't let it go forward in the United States, we got all kinds of countries knocking on our door in Asia and Europe. I think it's extraordinarily dangerous for the US if we let other countries take the lead. But if the Chuck Schumers of the world try to impede the progress of this movement, they're just gonna find it, they're circumvented. You know, they, they can't outlaw mathematics. They can't, this is all just based on the math that underlies cryptography. Mm. They can't be outlawed. It, it reminds me of the Ubers and Airbnbs in the world, what people, I guess, call like permissionless economy, sure. where they just go ahead and do it, and then it's almost like, okay, try to regulate this. Uh, do you foresee that becoming more and more common? Well, actually, we've taken an unusual stance because we, get how explosive this is. I said from the beginning, I don't want to mount gox this. I don't want to try to go around the regulators. I'm going to drive this right down the middle of Constitution Avenue or whatever. And so we've been actually working, and you're going to choke me for saying this, we've been working very constructively with regulators, with FINRA and the SEC. I have a website called deepcapture.com, which is all about how captured regulators can be. But, and I was worried two years ago that they were going to really try to stop us so as to protect the wall, their Wall Street clients. But uh, that has not been the case. And if anything, Does I have Does that mean to, that you have captured the regulators? No, it means we've liberated them. Okay. Actually, we've reached enough of them to, un to get them to see if they're worried about systemic risk, this is a great solution. Hmm. If they're worried about the kinds of mischief that they're supposed to be worried about, this is a great solution. It's a crazy wedge issue because the regulators have realized that the claim I explained a couple minutes ago is true, that the kinds of mischief they're in the business of preventing, we can actually make impossible. The, the, key, the key point to understand is that the main event of Bitcoin is really not Bitcoin. It's this thing called the blockchain. The blockchain is the technology that was invented seven years ago and you can apply it to money and create things like Bitcoin, but you can apply it to capital markets and create shares of stock that have these properties I described. We're also funding a company that is the blockchain applied to central banking. And it's called bit.com, B-I-T-T.com. Mm -hmm. And we're the main funders behind it. It's based in Barbados. And it's creating central bank in a box, central bank on a laptop. Imagine a central banker can just issue his fiat currency onto a blockchain. About a month after we announced it, the central banks of Sweden, the UK, and Canada all jumped on board and said that they're starting research projects to do the same thing. A government would be able to 
kind of program their central bank to just inflate the currency at a steady rate and maybe program it to meet one or two other goals or objectives? All that becomes possible. All that becomes possible. Something like, well, in our case, what we're building is the mechanism that lets them issue their, their fiat on the blockchain. So there would be blockchain versions of, of Canadian dollars or US dollars or, mm. or whatever. The next step would be something like the Taylor rule where they could actually program an algorithm that would, be, that would take all the guesswork out of it for the markets. Where this is exactly what we're going to issue, says the central bank, and you won't automate it. Of course, someday that may lead to the day that people start wondering, is that candle really worth the game, having the central banker do that? And, huh. and that, that's what would get you to sort of a Bitcoin-based financial. Uh, so you, that's what I was wondering, like what would make people adopt a digital blockchain-based currency versus a fiat currency? And you're outlining there's probably several steps in between uh, to get there to mass adoption. Get the, get the, getting them first to adopt uh, accept a digital fiat currency right. is the first step. And listen, if the digital fiat system works better, then that'll just persist. But if, if the theories of some people are, hold true, eventually in this world of Darwinian selection, the, the currency that emerges, the digital currency that emerges won't be fiat. You've endorsed Governor Gary Johnson, the Libertarian Party candidate for president. What do you like about Gary Johnson? Why did you endorse him? He's pro-freedom. I've known Gary for about 10 or, and I use that word. I, we have, you may have noticed in our society, a group of people who call themselves progressives. Mm -hmm. You know, they've hijacked the word progress. They've, I guess they're, you know, they're, the hidden assumption is what they want actually is progress. A more powerful government would be progress. Uh, I, I figure if they can hijack the word progress, I can hijack the word freedom. So I define our position in the position of, say, the viewers of reason as pro-freedom. And Gary tends to be pro-freedom. I've liked Gary since I met him. He has, he believes in the right positions. He'd be a great president. Bill Weld would be a great vice president. I'm from New Hampshire. And I lived in New Hampshire while Bill Weld was governor of Massachusetts. And he was a very successful, like Gary, you have two successful Republican governors of Democratic states who were both reelected in landslides. Bill Weld was a very effective uh, and admired governor in Massachusetts. So the two of them, I, you know, I think they are head, shoulders, waist, and knees above the alternatives. You have been funding a movie called Rigged 2016, which is about the campaign of Gary Johnson and William Weld, and also I think about the two-party system. Could you uh, tell us about that project and why you decided to get involved? I actually funded uh, two years ago a, a fellow I know who makes documentaries, and he, then he crowdfunded some more to make a movie about our two-party system, not even knowing who the candidates were, make a documentary about the two-party system, the role the media plays, and then we met somebody from the, from that, know, that has been traveling with Gary Johnson, a guy named James Greenwood, has been traveling with Gary Johnson for a year. He's not part of the campaign, but he's been filming the campaign. And we realized that, so he had, he had all this great film and, docu and, and documenting the campaign. And we, for two years, have been documenting, documenting other aspects of the political system. And we realized we could get together and create a love child. And the love child is this movie, Rigged. The Citizens United case was about a political documentary, an anti-Hillary Clinton documentary. Since you're now making a political documentary in an election year, are you afraid of Hillary Clinton coming after you? Well, I would expect that if either Hillary Clinton or Donald Trump get elected, neither of them are going to be too happy about what they see in the documentary. The only one who uh, I think has a history of being vindictive and retaliatory would be Hillary Clinton. And uh, you So if, I, if, if our next interview is me in an orange jumpsuit somewhere, I, I won't be surprised. The documentary is called Rigged. As we tape this, Gary Johnson has been excluded from the at least the first presidential debate because he didn't meet a 15% polling threshold set by the Commission on Presidential Debates. Is that a symptom of a rigged system? And do you think Gary Johnson is going to be able to uh, overcome that? It's absolutely a, a symbol or a, of a, a sign of a rigged system. What they're really afraid of, if he gets on a, the stage, it, I think the, the race is over, both because of the antipathy the American people feel towards the two current candidates, plus, as the name of your magazine and show acknowledges, 
the pro-freedom people there's, are based in reason. And when a guy who's based in reason and logic like Gary Johnson gets up and talks to the, and, or if he had a chance to debate these two demagogues, I think he would wipe the floor with them. We've talked about Gary Johnson. We've talked a little bit about Hillary Clinton. When we talk about Donald Trump, he's someone that you have called a disgrace to America. What is disgraceful about Donald Trump? The way he conducts himself. I don't consider Donald Trump a businessman. Donald Trump inherited $300 million, ran it all the way up to zero, went bankrupt four times, conducted himself extremely improperly as a businessman, the way he shafted various bondholders and played games and such. Then he reinvented himself as a reality TV star and made tens of millions of dollars. More power to him. This is America and good for him. But you know, Kim Kardashian made tens of millions of dollars as a reality TV star. I don't want her to be president. And Donald Trump has no business being president. He's a fake a capitalist. He's a fake businessman. He just plays one on this on the on a TV show. Uh, no one in their right mind 20 years ago, no one would no one invested with Donald Trump anymore. You wouldn't invest with Donald Trump because of the way he's treated his investors and and such. So so setting all that aside, then from the way he started you know, his campaign, talking about the Mexican rapist. And I actually went on Fox once he did that and said unkind things about him. But then when he said this stuff about John McCain, you know, he's a loser, I want a guy, you know, however you feel about the Vietnam War, you're saying that about John McCain. I want a guy who doesn't get shot down or whatever, that's just not the kind of guy we want as president. And Hillary, of course, belongs in an orange jumpsuit. I'm, I think it's, it's, you know, just the fact that she's running marks our descent into banana republic status, let alone if she wins. Surveying the political, social, and cultural landscape right now as a CEO and entrepreneur, are you optimistic about the future or are you pessimistic? Well, I'm optimistic about the, like for our, as a CEO for our, our company and such, now, I'm quite pessimistic about where the country is. I think that we are, you know, nothing's been fixed in the system. I think we're on the very brink of a, another financial crisis, worse, quite possibly worse than 2008. All they're doing is they're giving Novocaine, they're shooting Novocaine with cheap free money in the system to float us, to try to get us through this election. They're never gonna raise, they can't raise interest rates because once they do, it will reveal there is no recovery. There's no recovery, it's all fake and we're gonna be in a recession as soon as they try to raise interest rates if we're really not already. So no, I think that there's a huge financial, global financial crisis, probably gonna break first in Europe and then ripple its way here. I expect something really, really ugly here. But on the other hand, we're, we're mostly in the electron business. I wouldn't wanna be in a business with in a department store, a big mall, and you've got all that capital tied up. But in our business, you know, if the, if the cookie crumbles, it crumbles from the outside in and we're standing in the middle. Patrick Byrne, thank you very much for talking to us. Thank you, Zachary. For Reason TV, I'm Zach Weissmuller.